necessarily mean there's no bubbles. I thought you might have to pick them up. I don't think so. You see the look he gave me, though? Someone else. 
things that it might mean, uh, or it should mean, or it could mean. <coughs> uh, and I'll give you an example. When uh, I was a youngster growing up, I would ask my mom if uh, I could do something. And if the, if the word was okay, hey, I want to hit it. And she said, well, I don't know. There was about a 99% chance that the answer was no. Not quite 99%, but it was pretty close to that. Sister Linda, she says, well, I don't know. I, well, might as well just plan on doing something else because that's not going to be done. But if she said no, you can't do it. No, it's not going to be done. No. Oh, she had, and, and she didn't say no. She just said no. That was the end of the subject. Don't bring it up. Don't wall it around. Don't, don't, don't try to resurface it. Because the subject is closed. Two little letters, N-O. And there's a lot of people that think no means, well, not today. It means tomorrow, maybe. Or it means, well, if we might be able to do it, uh, let's go ahead and start it and see what happens. When mom said no, <laughs> sister Judy, <coughs> word is no. That's all there was to it. But uh, words do have uh, special attributes. Uh, and in, the Bible, in our Bible study that we've been having on Wednesday <coughs> night, uh, we've been specially looking at special words and special phrases uh, because especially... In the book of Revelation, there is so much there, and if you miss a particular phrase, or if you miss a particular way that something is said, if you look at it the wrong way, why, you can miss the whole thing. So, what we want to do today is we want to pick out some of the things that um, I've noticed, uh, and we're certainly not going to pick out all of them, but I, as I was reading and studying earlier this week, uh, a thought came to me that some there, there are some little gems of information uh, that can get lost if we're not diligent in our study. And I just wanted to share a few of those with you. And we'll start with this one right here. And God said, let there be light, and there was light, Genesis 1, 3, and 5. And in the evening and the morning were the first day. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Our precious and most kind Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we thank you, Father, for all of the many blessings. We thank you most importantly for Jesus and for what his sacrifice meant and still means to us. But we also thank you, Father, for your word, because sometimes we need a more definitive answer to a question that we have. And that definitive answer we can often find in your word. Looking through your word, praying and asking for guidance and direction, we find answers to questions that sometimes we didn't even know what the question was, but you give us the answer and then you show us what the question was, or you give us the answer to a question that we had that was bothering us, worrying us. We just ask you, Lord, to open our hearts, open our minds this morning to your word. And we praise for all in Jesus' name. They all said it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out formed without void, and so forth. Those are the first couple of verses. And then he goes on here in verse 3, and he says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And then it goes on talking about a little bit more about the day. And then it says at the end there, and the evening and the morning were the first day. <clears throat> it seems as though it took God all day long to create light. It talks about light and darkness and so forth. It talks about there being a difference between uh, light and darkness. There is a difference, obviously. We've all been out in the bright noontime, sunshine day, and we've all also been someplace where the lights were out, the door was shut, there was no moon, it was pitch black, and you could take your hand like this and run across the face, you couldn't see anything. I never experienced that kind of darkness until 
we went to Ohio Caverns. I believe we were in the eighth grade when we did that. Uh, we went to Ohio Caverns. We got down in the lower portion of it. And the fellow said, now everybody get a hold of the rail and hold on tight and see if we're going to do something special here. We lit the lights off. And I think there was probably 30 of us there, 40 of us in the class. And you heard a hoop, hoop, a few gasps and so forth. And he said, now, look around and see who you can see, who you can tell, who you can identify. He said, if you can't identify any person, he said, run your hand across the front of your face and see if you can see that. And of course, obviously, in absolute pitch, total black darkness, there was nothing you could see. I think there was a few of them that was there that was praying that when he flips the light switch, the lights come back on. Uh, and of course, they did. <clears throat> but the point was, there is a difference between light and dark. God created light. But one of the things that we miss in this particular three verses here, God also created time. Before God created light, there was no reason for time at all. There was no 10,000 years in heaven or 20,000 years in heaven or it wasn't Friday ever in heaven. You know, there, there's, if there is one day in heaven. That's, that's all heaven is. There is no night. So there was no reason for time until God created light. <clears throat> when he created light, he created a substance. He created an energy that travels at 186,000 miles per second. He had to create time in order to be able to measure light, in order to allow light to go. Uh, you've heard me say this before, I'll say it again. If you go out some night with your flashlight, and you shoot your flashlight up into the sky, <clears throat> you will create a beam of light a beam of light energy that will never quit until it is absorbed by something. Light does not lose its energy. Light does not die until it strikes a surface and does something. Light coming down from the sun in the summertime strikes the surface of Lori's bean patch. And beans grow and grow and grow. Next year, I'm going to go out to the far end of the bean patch. I'm going to put a big hook, not that big around, that has a matching end to the chain on my tractor. And when I get taken sick and tired of picking beans, I'm going to pull the whole thing out or something like that. But sunshine and light, obviously. Light right now here in this room. Linda can see me. I can see Linda. Uh, we can see Nag. Whatever he's doing there. He's looking very diligent at something. <clears throat> Gary can look up here and make sure that I'm not tripping and falling or passing out. He has to come up. Uh, light is useful for so many things. God created light so that we would have the ability to see each other, to get around, to communicate, to walk, to talk. Uh, there are hundreds of reasons that God created light. Uh, navigation is just one of them. But again, at the end of creating light, he had to create time so that he could measure the light. He could measure the distance that the light was going. In order to do that, again, he had to create time, and that's where we see the second creation that's not actually even talked about, but he created time that particular day, and he called it morning and evening. And the evening and the morning were of the first day there. And if you notice <clears throat> the way it said there, and the evening and the morning were the first day. That is also why the Jewish way of doing their day starts at sundown 
and goes to sundown of the next day. It's the evening and the morning. <clears throat> we start our day in the middle of the night and go to the middle of the next night. That's our 24-hour period. Their 24-hour period, actually, today, it starts at 6 and ends at 6. But years past, sundown marked the end of whatever day it was and the beginning of a new day. That was the way they did it. So in the summertime, their days were, the daylight made the day a little bit longer. Uh, and of course, in the wintertime, the darkness made the day a little bit shorter. It was still 24 hours, but the uh, time in between there seemed to be different. But he did, <clears throat> as we look at this, we see that he created uh, light in order to give us light, in order to give us the ability to navigate and get around, in order to give us the ability to communicate. He gave us that, and then again, by doing so, he also created time. And also, we wanted to go a little bit farther in the creation. From the first day, we wanted to move up to this day right here. Because this is a special day. And God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after his kind, and it was so. The last thing that God spoke into existence, and I want you to understand, I want to emphasize this speaking into existence, was the animals. He spoke into the existence the animals of the forest, the animals of the jungle, the animals of the plains, the animals of the woods, uh, the animals of the deserts. He spoke all of those into existence. Now, if you go over into the book of John, the book of John says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And everything that was made was made by Him. Without Him, anything that was made was not made. What we find there is two pieces of the puzzle of creation. We have God speaking, and God spoke into existence the animals, but we have Christ making the animals. Now, how did, how did that occur? How did that work together? <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea. Other than it says God spoke the animals into existence, and it said that Jesus, the Lord God, made those things that were all done. So the two of them were involved in the creation together. This happened on the sixth day. This is the last thing that God spoke into existence. And by the way, if you happen to be a person, and I know here in the church we don't have anybody, but if on one of the YouTube, uh, one of the people watching this message by YouTube or on a DVD, <clears throat> if you happen to believe in this thing called evolution, evolution states that once upon a time, billions of years ago, there was a little one-celled animal that became a long-celled animal that became like a fish or something like that, and one day that fish or whatever it was crawled up out of the ocean up on the land and said, I ain't going to be a fish no more, I'm going to be an animal. So it wandered up on the land there, and it said, you know, I don't like being a fish. I think I'm going to be a, I think I'm going to be a horse. So it evolved into a horse, and its brother evolved into a giraffe, and its other brother evolved into a lion, and another one evolved into an elephant. Now, the question is, for all that believe in evolution, where are the links? From the fish that crawled up out of the water to the elephant, to the giraffe, to the lion, to the hyena, to the butterfly. Where are those evolutionary links? Not one of them, Brother Bob, exists. Nowhere. <clears throat> now, there are animals that are similar in appearance, that seems to have been created differently or have learned differently. How many of you know what a zebra is? Everybody's hand goes up. 
Okay, whatever it happens. How many of you knows what a horse is? Every hand goes up. They look very similar to each other. Except the horse is a little bit taller and the zebra is a little bit shorter. The horse seems to be less densely muscled than the zebra is. But uh, I don't think, now I'm going to have to ask, uh, Mary, have any of your horses that you ever had had to run away from a lion? No. Uh, Pam, has any of your horses had to run away from a mountain lion or a wolf? No. No. See, those horses don't have to do that. Some of the horses out west, some of the wild horses, they do have that problem, and they will tend to be a little more densely muscled just simply because of the daily exercise that they get. They will be a little more densely muscled than the regular horse that you find the typical uh, homebound horse. The animals in Africa, the zebra, will be the same way. But the zebra also has developed an attitude. It's not something different in his brain. It's an attitude. It's an attitude of being wary, of being careful, of being scared. A zebra has almost never been able to be tamed to the point that they are like a horse. If, if you go back there and you talk to Sister Mary, Sister Mary can tell you some loving stories about horses. She's been around them enough. She can tell you that horses have the ability to intertwine with a human being or with a dog, or with a cow, or with a sheep, or with a goat. They bond together. They make friendships that are almost family-type friendships. Uh, when the cow across the street died, the donkey and the cow were good friends. You, you, you could go out there and watch them in the pasture They'd chase each other around, bite each other. They would kick each other. Not really hard, but they would kick each other a little bit. When the cow died, our brother across the street there almost had to take a chain and put it on the tractor to get the donkey away from burying the cow. Because the donkey actually got down in the hole where the cow was when they were burying the cow. That was his friend. Horses make those same relationships. Zebras do not. Again, the animals are very close in physical uh, size, uh, physical stature, physical makeup. Uh, the food they eat is very similar. You cut them open on the inside, you can't hardly tell the difference one from the other. Uh, do a brain scan on them, you can't hardly tell the difference one from another. But they have learned different patterns. That is the thing, that's the whole thing, the whole idea that evolution was built on. And it wasn't built on anything as big as horses and zebras. It was built on the difference between some birds in the South Pacific. Some of the birds had a bigger and stronger beak than the other birds had a smaller and weaker beak. Because the birds with the big beak lived on this island, and they had to eat hard nuts. The birds with the small beak lived on this island, and they had to eat small seeds. But they were basically the same bird. And the whole idea of evolution came from that scenario of the size and shape of the beak of birds. The whole idea of evolution is bunk. It's garbage. There is no proof anywhere on the face of this earth. If you go into the Bible and you work it out, we are right now about 6,065 years from creation. Now, given that the Bible wasn't really watching uh, when, when the writers wrote things down, 
they weren't as careful with dates and so forth. So that 6,000 years might be, might be stretched out to maybe 6,200, maybe even 6,300 years ago. But just remember, it's not beyond that. God spoke this place into existence. It didn't. There is another theory of evolution. And I'm telling you what, if you'd been there at my house and I read this, you'd have laughed. If, because you've seen me fall out of a chair dying laughing. <clears throat> this crazy clown came up with the idea that if everything there is, if all of the mass of everything there is, if all of the atoms and molecules could be compressed to where they touched each other, you could hold the entire world in a tablespoon. Now this is the silly stuff that is it's taught in school for a Crazy, goofy, silly, nonsensical stuff. When we look at the animals that are out there, with the exception of some that have been killed off, you know, we, we as human beings have destroyed whole uh, species of animals. But other than the ones that have been killed off, and even those that have been killed off, the great auk or one of them, uh, the passenger pigeon, uh, 120, 130 years ago, uh, the passenger pigeon came through uh, Ohio, Kentucky. People went out there with clubs and killed passenger pigeons. There was a big pigeon that stood about that tall. They were land on the ground and they were hard to get up out of the, out of the back into the air. They went out with clubs, Sister Linda. They killed those things and canned them like they were meat. And we killed off passenger pigeons. But to make a long story short, every animal that we have, that we know of, we can find specimens of their skeletons. We can find pieces of their bodies for the last six to 7,000 years that we can date. And then after that, it's, well, you know, I believe this giraffe existed 7,942 centuries ago. Where did you get that idea from? Where did, where did those numbers come from? I have no idea. And I'm sure they, I'm actually sure, Sister Linda, they don't have any idea. But they teach that the little worm became a fish. The little fish crawled up out of the land. And when it got up on the land, it said, I'm going to be yours. Oh, and by the way, there was another little fish that crawled up on the land and said, I'm going to be a human one of these days. So we evolved from the primordial goo. <laughs> Sister Pam's back here going, uh-uh, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, uh-uh, uh-uh, that's wrong. We did not evolve. God created us. And that's the next thing I wanted to share with you. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. I want you to look very carefully there in the very first part of that. And the Lord God formed man. If you look in the New Testament, what is one of the big names for Jesus Christ? Lord. The Lord God. What does the Bible say? That God created all this stuff. He spoke this into existence, but that Jesus Christ was there. Nothing was made except that he made it. With the hands of Jesus Christ, that's the way I believe it. That's the way I believe the word says here. With the hands of Jesus Christ, so much dirt was picked up one day, Brother Charlie, that dirt was formed into a man. The breath of life was put into his nostrils. He stood on his feet. And that's where man came from. Man did not come from a little fish that crawled up on the beach there one day and said, one of these days, I'm going to be a man. It didn't happen that way. God created man. God created man so that man could populate the earth. And when we look at some of the engineers that look out their windows uh, from 
the 13th floor and the 20th floor and the 50th floor and the 80th floor. They look out their windows and they try to get inspiration. Let me tell you about inspiration. The inspiration that God had to create man, he created a being that not only could recreate itself. Linda has 14 boys and 3 girls. Is that it? I'm not that many. Linda has children. Well, we basically all of us have children here from lunch. We have recreated ourselves. Our children carry our DNA. Our children's blood type and so forth can be tested and they can prove without a reasonable doubt whatsoever this child does belong to Linda or this child today ain't no way. This child belongs to Joni or Nancy or Sherry or somebody, but not Linda. Because of the way God created us to be able to reproduce, not only did he create us with the ability to reproduce Physically, he gave us the ability to reproduce and then teach the next generation things that would help them in their life. Man standing up here on the 88th floor just wishes as an engineer he could create something like that. That not only would it reproduce, but before it reproduced, or when it, after it reproduced, it would be able to teach its new reproduction all of the things that it had learned in the past. And man cannot create that. Man has not came up with that ability. And the fun part about it is God didn't have to look in a book to figure out how to do it. God just up and did it. Thank God. He created us. Man is the only creation formed by the hands of God from the dirt he created. Man is a totally different and more important form of creation. We were created by the hands of God. We were not spoke into existence. These are just a few things that we find where we look at the words that are said and we see so much that we might not have seen otherwise if we didn't look at it a little bit differently. If we move into the New Testament, in Matthew, we find coming down from this man that God created, we find there was a man named Abraham, and about the 10th generation after Abraham there was a man whose name was Salmon. Salmon got married, and his son's name was Boaz, Boaz also married, he had a son named Obed, and Obed was the grandfather of David, the second king of Israel, a person the Bible called a man after God's own heart. So you say, Brother Dwight, what's so significant about these people? Well, let's look at the scripture concerning them. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rechab, Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. When God created man, he knew, and if you look up here, just, just, just hang on for a minute, he knew that men and women were going to do things that he did not want them to do. So when he created man and when he created woman, he also created another thing. In fact, he created three other things. The first one, the most important one, is called repentance. For man, he created repentance. There is no repentance out there for the rattlesnake that kills a squirrel and eats it. There's no repentance out there for the lion that kills a zebra and eats it. There's no repentance out there for the squirrel that crawls up in the eagle's nest, breaks the egg, and eats it. That squirrel doesn't repent over eating the eagle's egg. In fact, the squirrel comes back up and looks again. How many, how many of you have bird feeders at home with squirrel problems? Just one. 
No, that won't work. I was going to say, I got a 12-gauge shotgun that will take care of your school problem, but you're too close to your neighbors there. Maybe a 410 might do it. There's no repentance in the world out there. There is repentance within mankind. Mankind is the only thing that God created that needs repentance. The rest of them, they just go on with what they're doing. Uh, if Mary got kicked by a horse, that horse didn't come around three weeks later and say, Mary, I'm awful sorry I kicked you. They don't do that. There's no repentance there. But you see, God wanted us to have that ability to say we were sorry. So he repented. He created two other things. He created confession and he created forgiveness with repentance in the middle. Create confession is the first thing we do where we own up to having done things that we should not have done. That's confession. God created confession for the human being. He did not create confession for the fish. Now he created sorry for the fish because the fish bit the hook and the hook pulled the fish up out of the water and he got invited to dinner. But uh, he, didn't, he didn't do any confession and repentance. Mankind confesses that what they did was wrong. Mankind repents by saying, I wish I hadn't done it and I plan on not doing it ever again. And then God created forgiveness. When we look at these stories up here to go along with confession and repentance and forgiveness, uh, we look at this verse, we find that Solomon did not marry a virgin. And you may not recognize the name up there. Uh, Rachel, you may not recognize that name because that's a little bit different spelling than it is over in the Old Testament. Rahab was Rahab. Rahab was the lady who housed the two spies in the city of Jericho, who took care of them, who lied to the king about them having run away, hid them up on the roof, and later that night let them down out of the window on a red rope. In the Bible, she's listed as Rahab the harlot. You say, well, now, Brother White, uh, what's a harlot? Well, there's a, nine, there's a 20, 21 word for Rahab's occupation. It was prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. We go a little bit farther in that same verse there, and we see this other woman, her name is Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. She was from Moab. She had married an Israelite man, had not had any children. The Israelite man had died. Her mother-in-law wanted to come back to Israel. She came back with her mother-in-law. In the same way that Rahab took care of the spies, Ruth took care of her mother-in-law. She cared for her mother-in-law until she died. God saw the repentance of Rahab, the harlot. God saw the sorrow of Ruth, the Moabitess. God saw the desire for both of them to want to be people that God would be proud of. So they repented of what they could have done wrong. They confessed that they wanted to be good people and God not only did God accept them, look here what he did with them. <laughs> this is the fun part. God put them in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Yes, there's a prostitute in there. Yes, there's a Moabite, a woman who was from one of the worst heretical groups out there. They were heretics from the word go. They were mean people. They were bad people. But she came in and she said, I don't want to be a mean person. I don't want to be a bad person. The rest of my life, I want God to forgive me the things I could not change. And I want God to accept me. And guess what? God did. 
Both are women that in some religious circles would never be accepted. And I'm glad today to share with you that not only did God accept them, but he put them in his word so that we would know that he accepted them. He may have accepted them and have they not been in the Bible, we would never have known about them. But because it was possible that some of us might sin, because it was possible that some of us might have a problem with the way we were living, it was possible that some of us might need to confess and repent and be forgiven, God put Rahab, God put the other lady both in the Bible so that we could see them, we could see the great hope that they had. One lady had things that she could change, the other had things that she couldn't change. But both had a desire to be one of God's people, and both overcame the bad things in their lives. How wonderful is God's mercy? How wonderful is God's love? As the song says, how great thou art. Praise God. Well, this morning, I don't know what may be going on in your life. Perhaps someone here has something they would like to pray about this morning. As Sister Linda comes up to share page 81 with us, uh, we can all stand. And again, I don't know your heart this morning. I don't know your need this morning, but God does. God does know that if you have a need, He would like to talk to you about it. He would like for you to talk to Him about it. If you have a desire, He would like to talk to you about it. He would like you to talk to Him about it. So is there one this morning that Sister Linda begins to sing? Is there one this morning that can say, Brother Dwight, take me by the hand? Take me by the hand, Brother Dwight, and let's pray.
place to be this morning. Even if the sunshine didn't come out, maybe we don't get to drive home in 75 degree weather. Remember our prayer requests. And again, uh, just take a quick moment to uh, wish all of you a very happy and. Oh,